Uh, welcome to uh, Breaking Ground. The next talk is by Ryan, and it is microservices and functions as service for offensive security. So, Ryan. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for having me here, and thanks for coming out to my talk. Um, today, I'm going to talk about microservices and functions as a service for offensive security. A little bit about me. My name is Ryan. I work as a penetration tester at Centurion in Singapore. Um, and my first um, discovery of uh, functions as a service started in January 2015 when AWS came out with Lambda available for uh, general preview to all customers. And what really became interesting about uh, Lambda to me was that um, it allows you to run one million um, executions of your code for free every, every month. Um, and essentially the idea is you upload your code and that gets triggered and it does some function for you similar to the idea of a microservice. Um, yeah. So the, when Lambda first came out, it only supported Node.js. And what kind of got more interesting is when I discovered Lambdash by Eric Hammond, and that allowed you to kind of get a shell. So you could run some commands, it would inject that into the Lambda function, get, give you the output, and you could explore this temporary uh, shell environment. So this led to the idea of serverless, and serverless is this concept of where you don't need to worry about the servers, managing them, running them, keeping them running, uh, paying for them when they're not being used, and the ability to kind of scale up uh, based on demand for your code. If we look at the stack, um, functions as a service is on the far right, so we see that you just put your code in there, and then the interpreter, such as like Python and Node.js, and everything down from the stack is all managed by the service provider. Uh, one very simple example, which is always given by Lambda, is you have a photograph taken by some users. Um, they upload to S3 bucket, and that triggers a Lambda function, and that will in turn maybe add some terrible filter to your photograph and then upload that back to the user. So if we look more in a security perspective, uh, Airbnb came out with uh, Stream Alert, which is a way to scale up your log parsing, ingestion kind of rule um, that you that you would apply to any kind of logs. So if you have a scalable uh, server infrastructure where it's generating lots of logs based on user demand, you can now have a scalable logging infrastructure to capture all that information, run some rules to kind of detect abuse, and then trigger another function to send maybe an alert to PagerDuty or Slack, and so on. So there's been quite a few um, related projects with uh, Lambda that people have discovered. Another one is um, looking at kind of automating. So you might have uh, EC2 uh, firewall rules that you want to allow a developer to SSH into a server so that maybe they hit an API endpoint that triggers a Lambda function to run, which changes the security groups, and then the developer can log in. Um, you could also have um, like monitoring a CDN network, so you look at maybe Cloudflare's servers, and you automatically update that list into your, your web server's uh, security groups so that Cloudflare can always connect in and get the latest uh, cache content of your web servers. So recently, AWS came out with their web application firewall, and they tied together the use of Lambda to be able to make sense of the web application firewall logs in another way that you could um, detect abuse and then automatically um, you know, blacklist an IP address or kick out a user. So now we're going to look at uh, simple Hello World. Um, so I have a few examples here to run through. Um, first is going to be Google Cloud Platform. Um, essentially, they only support Node.js at the moment. But if you use uh, Python shell uh, by this extra bacon on GitHub, you can just have a Python script, wrap it in this uh, node.js module, and then you can just um, use your Python script that you have. So very simple, we just click next, next, next through everything as usual, and we get to the zip file upload, and basically we just need to wrap everything into uh, one folder, and we zip it up, and we have a very simple uh, node.js file, which is just going to call our worker.py, and our worker.py script is just three lines in Python to do URL lib, uh, make a call out to open DNS, get the current IP address, and write it out. So we can kind of get to see a little bit of um, where we're operating from when we upload to Google Cloud. So we do that, we upload it, and we test the function, and we get an IP version 6 address. So what's interesting about Google Cloud functions is that you get a native IP version 6 address, and this is kind of unique compared to the other service providers. If we look at IBM's OpenWhisk, 
Uh, what's unique about this is that they allow you to upload a Docker image. So instead of just having a piece of code or some script that you upload where you don't really have much control over the environment it runs in, you can now upload like a Docker image and have that run. So a lot more flexibility there. And this also, they also give you an IP version 4 address. So when you talk about um, Docker, there's also um, this site called Play With Docker. And the idea behind this is to leverage on Docker Swarm. And so you go to the site playwithdocker.com, you click the captcha, and you get four hours of like basically a free shell where you can just play around with Docker and see the environment and see what it would be like. Um, so they have uh, playwithdocker.com, and they also have the code up there if you want to run it locally and set it up and test it out in your own environment. And essentially what they're doing is they're running it on an AWS instance, and they have a Python set up. Um, so some of the pros of this is that it's anonymous, there's no account registration, you don't have to identify yourself in any way, you just need to tick a box on a CAPTCHA. But the downside is, of course, it's time limited, and then there's a the CAPTCHA, so it can be difficult to automate kind of getting this free shell for four hours every time. <clears throat> okay, let's talk a little bit about cost. So there's this site called serverlesscalc.com, which gives you a very good overview of the cost of different platforms. If we think back to the example I showed, just simple three-line Python script to run, get your current IP address and output it, it runs in 300 milliseconds. Um, so they do measurements in 100 milliseconds at a time. Um, so this 300 milliseconds, you could run that 10 million times a month for $1.80. Um, so we see, and you also get a, a million executions for free. So we can see it's very cost effective to just run your code and upload it there and only pay when it runs and the time it takes to run. So if you look across uh, all the different service providers, you can see uh, Amazon and Azure are clearly leading the pack because they have the most uh, support by region. And if we give a quick overview, we can see the benefits of um, Google is that you get IP version 6, IBM, you get a Docker image that you can play with, and for AWS, you have uh, 14 regions, Azure, you have 23. Um, some of the differences, like Azure, they support PowerShell, so if you're, you want to run, like, yeah, you have like more flexibility in the scripts that you're running. So I would say, in summary, if you look at the advantages of functions as a service, uh, there's low cost. You get sign-up credit with most of the, like AWS, you sign up, they give you $300. It's pretty hard to use all that $300 if you're only going to use a function as a service um, platform. Um, you get an uh, unspecified source IP address because your code's being injected into some random server within their infrastructure, which they manage. And you have uh, global data centers. So you can imagine you can get maybe an IP address out of China, and you can do certain simulated attacks with that. So this led me to um, what I started was Project Thunderstruck, which is finding use cases for functions of the service in offensive security. And my whole goal with this is to explore the different cloud service providers and try to get supercomputer resources without paying supercomputer prices. And today, at B-Sides, I'm going to be talking about searching in IP version 6. So a little bit of the past work in this area. Uh, Tobias Feibig gave a talk at CCC about six months ago in December. And uh, he was building upon the work by Peter Van Dyke. And essentially, they're mapping out the usage of IP version 4 by looking at DNS reverse entries. So a Standard compliant name server, if it complies to RFC 8020, um, if you go to search for a IP version 6 reverse address, it will reply with no error if there is um, nothing at that specific address but something um, more specific, and it will reply with NX domain if there's nothing there and nothing below it as well. So by using this difference in response when looking for the reverse addresses, you can narrow the search, the amount of space you need to search in, inside of IP version 6. Um, so, put more simply, on the command line, if you're running a dig and you dig for this IP address on the left, you'll get a no error, so you know that there's nothing at that specific address, but there's something further down. And if you do the five, you see you get an NX domain. So, um, you can actually try these out on these IP addresses to see the difference. Tobias's work, he used a supercomputer at his un university, which was used for machine learning. Um, so he had this, you know, one gigabit Ethernet connection, 80 threads, this crazy supercomputer. And he ran his script to kind of uh, enumerate all the DNS records in IP version 6. It, the first, first attempt took him one week. He found 70 million records. Um, but he also received a lot of abuse complaints from different ISPs because he's basically 
uh, enumerating every single possibility out of an ISP's um, DNS server and all their uh, reverse zones. So some ISPs will just assign a reverse zone for every single IP version 6 address which they have in their space, including maybe IP version 4. And so enumerating all of them generates a lot of DNS traffic to that server. Um, so in, in the second attempt, he then created a, um, kind of some parsing to detect auto-generated zones. And the idea was that if he finds one that uh, responds and then three others nearby, then he considers that to be a dynamically generated zone and he ignores the rest of that zone and moves on. So he ran his script. For three days, he got 1.6 million records. Now, it's important to note that there are, not all DNS servers are RFC 8020 compliant. So um, this is not a foolproof way to, you know, search the whole space. There is some limitations in this. And what Tobias then did is he came up with a way of seeding. So where do you start from in IP version 6? So he looked at routing information from route views and ripe NCC, and then he parsed out all the uh, advertised IP version 6 networks and used them as starting points to start looking for reverse DNS entries within those advertised networks. So instead of doing the whole IP version 6, just look at what's advertised and then drill down from there. So in his third attempt, uh, ran, his script ran for 70 hours. He read 80 threads and he managed to find 5.3 million records. And then in his fourth attempt, he tried to scale it even faster by running more threads and he ran 400 threads. Um, and it ran for 22 hours, but he only found 2.2 million. And the limit that he reached is that he, he found out that uh, he was only using one IP address on the supercomputer, and his server ran out of sockets. So when I saw this, I figured this must be a good case for using functions as a service, because I'm running code. It's running on all these different servers all over the place. So maybe I can kind of overcome this limitation that he, that he faced. So I took a look at his code. They released, and basically it's doing wget and uh, curl to get the information using BGP dump to carve out all those IP version 6 networks, and then some sort in parallel, and then some Python scripts to enumerate the DNS. So my plan, um, so then at the end of his talk, someone asked him where's his data set, and he didn't release it, so he just said that it's stored in a distributed manner across lots of DNS servers. So my plan was to kind of come up with a way to get the same data set so I could start to look at some more interesting uh, DNS entries that are out there. So we're going to follow the same steps, download the routing information, uh, parse it, get the IP version 6 addresses, start enumerating, and go on. So this is the, kind of the architecture of the plan that I had. I have a getdata.py script. can go and download all the latest uh, routing information, parse it, run it through PGP dump, write it all out to a text file. Then I run start workers, and start workers is just going to start triggering Lambda workers. And every time it finds a no error response from a DNS server in a certain zone, it's just going to spawn itself again. Um, and this is because in AWS Lambda, you have a time-limited window of which your script can run. So the maximum you can set is five minutes. So if you're enumerating a DNS uh, entry zone and it's running for more than five minutes, it's going to die. And then you, you've lost that state. You don't know if there's anything further down in there. So making a recursive call to start again with the same information is a way to overcome that. And if I find any PTR records, I'm just going to store them into DynamoDB. And then I can use the web interface to look at it. So I ran my script, I got all the data, I ran the start workers, and I triggered all the workers to start in about five minutes and 48 seconds, um, which is, seems really fast. And, but I only managed to get 250,000 records. So I was scratching my head figuring out what, what happened, what went wrong with this. And what I realized is that I didn't scale up DynamoDB enough. All right? So I had all these, like maybe 200,000 workers all going at one time, all trying to run DynamoDB, and DynamoDB is just limiting it to a certain limit to say, nope, you can only write you know, 100 items per, per second. And I'm trying to write like 300,000 per second. So I gotta um, kind of scale it down and uh, try and figure out a way to more scale the backend. Um, so if you look at the capacity calculator that DynamoDB has, if you wanna do like basically just some rough uh, numbers, if I wanted to do 1,500 uh, writes per second to the database, it would cost me uh, 800 US dollars a month. So it's getting a little bit expensive. So I did my first run, and the improvements I came up with was that I had to um, control the amount of scale that I have in, um, in my functions. I can't always recall a recursive function. I have to kind of slow it down. So I came up with a timer. If you look in the AWS Lambda, they have a context function. You can see how much time is remaining in that script that you're running. 
So if I, I have like a simple um, check that if there's 30 seconds or less remaining, then I uh, take the current state and trigger a new worker, pass it off to that one. So kind of slow it down a bit. I also created a uh, depth search limit. And the idea is that instead of trying to search the whole IP version 6 space, I just search a little bit down at one time. And then I use all that as a starting point to search a little bit further, more specific and more specific. Um, and then starting the worker slowly is to not kind of overload uh, everything that's going on. And a trick with Dynamo DB is that you can scale it up for when you need it, and then you can scale it down for when you're not, um, when you don't need that time. So you can only pay for when it's scaled up, and then you can scale it back down and pay a few dollars. And the web interface for Dynamo DB, which looks, looks like this, is quite clunky, and it usually has that pause button at the top. So whenever you search for something, it searches and searches, and then it, it, has, it asks you to click resume, and it's not, not very great. So what did I find? So I found a lot of uh, kind of KVM, like management um, DNS entries that were out there. So you can see um, things like the IPMI, ILO, out of bound, like the DRAC, the Dell remote access controller. We find them on a lot of um, interesting sites. So things like NIST.gov is in there. Um, and some like service providers, they just have like ESX servers all with their ILOs. Uh, with IP version 6 and advertising them, you know, through DNS records. Uh, I also looked, like, did a search for .mil and I found some somewhat interesting uh, .mil addresses and .gov. For .gov, you can see, like, routing protocols, like HSRP and VRRP. So you see a lot of network infrastructure, firewalls, and maybe some interesting naming convention that can give you a clue to what's going on and what those IP version 6 addresses are being used for. I also managed to find some uh, interesting infrastructure out there. So if you look at like Equinix, um, the big data center provider, they actually have site-to-site uh, -site links between all their data centers and they boast about a lot of interconnectivity. And when you look at um, the DNS entries, you can see um, not only where, uh, like, like geographically where those data centers are and where those routers are for the IP version 6, but also the clients who are using those systems. So that's kind of quite interesting to kind of see that you have uh, like Cloudflare and Oracle, Box and Twitter and VMware and Netflix. You can kind of see all their customers, but you can also see uh, kind of loopback addresses for uh, routing devices, right? So if you look at uh, networking devices, usually you have a, a loop zero or LO zero, and that's like the management interface for that network device. Um, also managed to find the kind of D-Wave quantum computer um, that NASA uses, so they have uh, DNS entries in there for, I guess they have like a firewall, a monitor, a QC, I don't know what those things are, but they look kind of interesting. All right, so in summary, um, I, I managed to replicate Tobias's work um, using functions as a service to do it for much cheaper without access to supercomputers. I didn't receive any abuse emails um, because I guess nobody really can tie it back between uh, me using Amazon service to do all these DNS um, recursive queries versus, uh, you know, Tobias for using an ISP, using his university and everyone kind of knows where to report them to. Um, some of the things I learned were to kind of avoid using a recursive function all the time. So when I was practicing this, um, when I was trying out what I was doing, um, I basically ended up recursing too much and spawning up tons and tons of workers. And so I kind of Got to learn how to control that and build something in place. And in terms of the back end, when I first started, I used Elasticsearch, uh, but that didn't scale very well. It didn't scale on the two gig of RAM, um, like DigitalOcean server that I used. And then using uh, Amazon kind of hosted service for Elasticsearch just was too expensive. So I think in order to kind of take this a bit further, it's about getting more data for seeding. So looking at maybe like TrustedSec, they have the hard cider. Um, which is very interesting, kind of gets the same idea, like getting more routing information, figuring out what's advertised, and then using that, that data, maybe looking for some more public data sets as well. Um, the good thing with DynamoDB is that you can set up triggers. So when there's a new write into DynamoDB, you can trigger another Lambda function. So you can trigger another Lambda function to maybe do a port scan or maybe look up in like Census, Mr. Looker, or like Shodan to try and figure out what's the publicly available information on that IP version 6. Um, and a trick with AWS Lambda is that they give you a, 
uh, free, those free one million executions which you have are per region. So if you spread your function out and your workload across different regions, you can maximize getting enough free time. Okay, so if you find this interesting, I'd highly recommend you check out um, some previous talks on the left, the Gone in 60 Milliseconds by Rich Jones. Um, there's also some talks that happened at uh, Black Hat last year. And this year there's a talk tomorrow um, at Black Hat and another talk at DEF CON um, on microservices. And then I'll be speaking again on DEF CON on Saturday, but I'm gonna be talking about uh, two different attacks. So one is using a, creating a distributed denial of service attack and then uh, brute forcing SMS OTP. So if you find this interesting, um, some more things that might kind of spark your interest in kind of looking into this, this area is um, AWS also has a kind of high memory instance for Lambda, which is 1.5 gigs of memory. And you can run you know, 266,000 seconds for free every month in this high memory environment. And if you want to look more into like the China hosting, there is a Alibaba Cloud at Aliyun, but you need a plus 86 mobile number and you need to go and register on the China website. And then I think IBM's open WISC with the Docker support is very interesting because you get much more control over the environment that's running. Um, yeah, yeah, and if you want to try it out on your own, I would recommend looking at the, this GitHub um, repository on the right because it's uh, used, what's used in uh, Play with Docker. Uh, if, you wanna, if you don't want to play for a service and you want to try it out yourself. Um, so I hope that as part of my talk that I was able to kind of uh, get across the message that um, of my interest in function as a service and kind of generate some of your interest to kind of spark more uh, security projects in this space and scale all the things. And um, that's the end of my talk. And I'm going to be uh, putting up my slides and some code examples at the GitHub link below. Ryan, do you want to take questions? You have 10 minutes more. Yeah, sure. <laughs> any any questions around? Uh, you can raise your hands. I can bring the mic to you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, if you're doing some of these things with AWS in terms of trying to scan other sites and so on, AWS doesn't particularly like you doing these kind of things. Yeah. So um, they'll <laughs> shut your account down and they'll do all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff like that. So uh, you have to be a little bit careful. Yeah, I, I mean, you raise a really good point. If you look at using EC2 instances in Amazon, you always get the abuse emails because you don't sign up for like pen testing requests, which is what I always end up doing. Um, but if but I didn't get any of those similar abuse kind of reports using Lambda, so maybe there's an opportunity for Amazon to look deeper into monitoring Lambda. <laughs> Questions anymore? Fine, thank you, Ryan. Okay, thanks. <laughs>